Hi, I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review, and we couldn't be happier to host the fourth annual Insight Jam. I want to thank everyone who's participating this week, as well as our Insight Jam sponsors, Datastax, Monte Carlo, Denoto, High Gear, and Seller Data. I also want to thank our Solutions Review editors and staff for pulling this event together. When we started this in 2019, we wanted to take a moment at the end of the year to celebrate enterprise technology with a social media event offering best practices and predictions. This will be our biggest jam ever, including 16 live streamed expert panel discussions over four days. And we intend to keep the insights flowing in 2023 with the launch of an expert subscription site for any tech professional who wants to publish posts on Solutions Review. Again, thank you all for being here and enjoy the Insight Jam. Solutions Review presents Insight Jam, a social media celebration of enterprise technology. Hello and welcome back to the second panel of this year's Insight Jam. My name is Jonathan Paul. I'm the director of multimedia here at Solutions Review. And for the next 60 minutes, we're going to be talking with six experts from around the country about data security, why it's the new killer application in cybersecurity. Let me bring in all six of them now. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being here. It is a pleasure to host you for this live panel event. Chris, you've graciously agreed to moderate, so I'm going to let you start off with our introductions. Uh, 60 seconds or so, uh, tell our audience why you're here and what your background is, and um, good luck. Good, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan, appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Um, Chris Pruitt, I've been in IT and IT security for about 25 years, um, mostly on the customer side. So I've worked in a large enterprise for a good bit of my career. Um, today, I'm Chief Technology Officer of Inversion 6. We're an IT security company headquartered out of Cleveland, Ohio, um, product services, and uh, a consultancy. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, Miko. Yes, I'm, I'm Miko Dicini. I've uh, been in the... Uh... Networking and security space for about 20 years uh, or more. I work at A10 Networks. I run product management as a VP. I, uh, we are a major player in uh, providing cybersecurity and uh, DDoS solutions, as well as network security solutions. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Good to meet you. Gil? Hi, everyone. I'm Gil. I'm the CTO at SmartSense. Probably over two decades uh, in tech and various positions, mostly in healthcare and IoT. I'm currently the CTO at SmartSense, where we're, we are sensing as a service provider, we combine IoT with a cloud platform to protect different assets. Uh, I've been mostly on the con consumer side of security uh, for that time, and so that's why I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today and chat with all of you. Good. Good to meet you. Uh, Sam. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, Sam Adler, also couple decades in uh, in tech. Um, most recently, I've been doing a lot in identity management and now more so in, um, in cyber, um, well, cyberspace, uh, um, access control, that kind of stuff. So talk more about that. Good. Good to meet you. Scott, how about you? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try something here. Let me know if you can discern the difference. I'm Scott Gerlach, uh, CSO co-founder at Stackhawk. I've spent over a quarter century in IT security <laughs> uh, as a security operator. My latest venture is uh, as a founder startup um, startup leader. So we're working on that today. That's my focus right now. And last but not least, Justin. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Pleasure to join the panel today. My name is Justin Beals. I am the CEO and co-founder of StrikeGraph. Um, uh, my background uh, was a young computer hobbyist, turned it into a career after a liberal arts degree. Of course, that was a great mix for um, tech and startups, uh, which I've done for about 20 years now. Uh, mostly, I have been a VP of product or a, a chief technology officer until recently uh, when I started building StrikeCraft to help solve the problems that we were finding with compliance security and um, assessment. Good to meet you, sir. Um, well, f first off, you know, I, I'll open things up in just a minute, but I think, um, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, from the gray hair, I think we've all obviously been in IT security for a number of years. And, um, you know, with that, I would say job number one um, for security products, security people, really anything in the security industry has been about data protection, right? 
we're not necessarily trying to protect, you know, operating systems and networks. It's really about accessing data and the, the availability of data. Um, but with that, you know, that there's been kind of a, a newer area that this um, uh, data security platforms or, or data security solutions, you know, for, uh, for a long time, we've talked about, um, you know, endpoint protection, uh, network protection, we've got identity, cloud, we have all of these kind of small fiefdoms um, that we stack on top of each other. And are, are we actually, you know, moving toward a place that is really kind of data centric security rather than uh, just another layer that, that an attacker or, or um, someone needs to get through? So with that, I, I just kind of wanted to pose, you know, to each each one of you, what is data security to you? Uh, what does it mean? And you know, if if you had any, uh, um, you know, any thoughts on on the solutions around that, right? Data security platform. So Sam, we'll start with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's it's a very relevant topic because so many people are using SaaS. Um, you know, they they assume that the SaaS platforms themselves are secure, which in general they are, right? That's accessing it, you know, logging into a system or something. But the reality is, is that the data that you're using in that, you often are sharing it with other people, right? And everybody has shared, you know, a Google Drive document with somebody in Google Sheets or PowerPoint or, you know, something in Salesforce or Slack or GitHub. And as soon as you share that, um, you know, people are now realizing, hey, wait a minute, you know, that link can be seen by anybody with the link, right? And as corporations are now using uh, many SaaS applications, um, you know, to be able to uh, differentiate between what should be allowed to be shared, who should be allowed to be shared, say, publicly, or even just with the whole company, you know, say somebody is leaving the company, um, and they go in and start sharing sensitive documents with their own personal Gmail account, for example, right? I mean, we've, we've unfortunately seen these kind of examples. So it's not necessarily the security of the app, um, but, you know, we, we've built a platform that basically helps people, um, you know, monitor, orchestrate, do the remediation for the, as you were saying, the data that's within these applications, um, so, uh, you know, it's a it's a big, big issue. A lot of people don't even realize it's an issue until they kind of see it. Um, you know, we we love, we have always have this big aha moment, you know, after we do like a basic audit. And like, you know, did you realize that 10 percent of all your, you know, data on there is open to anybody with the link? And they're like, no, we didn't realize that. And, you know. I mean, while, while most of it might not necessarily be, you know, PII type data and stuff like that, um, it doesn't really take much for it to be insecure and for, you know, something major to happen. So um, hopefully that gives a little bit of a summary on uh, what I think is a pretty big issue and, and a worldwide issue that a lot of people are starting to struggle with. Good. Sam, um, appreciate it. Uh, Gil, what, what are your thoughts around uh, data security platforms? You know, the... Um, I think we, we've uh, um, seen things part and parcel over the years, right? You know, but as things have moved to the cloud, we've got data everywhere. Um, you know, to talk a little bit about data security platforms, maybe in kind of the, um, you know, the, the, the evolution or the use cases. Yeah, absolutely. So as Sam mentioned, data is everywhere today, right? So it's not really just protecting who can access it. Uh, once the data is available, it can be accessed. So I, I really see this as the evolution from a CCTV camera to a ring camera, right? If you if you look at the, you know, CCTV, it would record your house. Um, and if you put someone in front of the monitor 24-7, you could possibly detect an intruder. Um, or if you knew that there was an intrusion, you could go back and pull up the recording. But what if you had a thousand houses? Now that, that becomes a problem. Um, if you look at the Ring or you know Google or all these new cameras that are coming out, they're doing the same thing. They're watching your house, but there's a system that's actually looking at the stream, um, and it can identify if it's just a cat going or somebody's actually trying to intrude. Um, and at that point, it's sending you an alert or it's taking action. So that's really the big difference, and that was was missing in the previous tools. 
It's that intelligence and the proactiveness. And I think that's what the new platforms are kind of bringing to the, to the table. Gil, thanks. So J Justin, you know, you, you obviously have uh, some focus on compliance. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, has pushed a lot of these, right? You know, um, who has access to that, right? You're trying to often answer basic questions when it, when it comes to data access. You know, what did they do with it? Who did they share it? Who has access? What kind of access, right? Um, from from a, a data security perspective or, or even a re really more of a solution, a data security platform, um, what are the what are the kinds of things that uh, people ought to be looking for or really require? Yeah, I think when you're talking about a data security platform, especially as you might want to apply its implementation towards a compliance outcome, and of course the standards that we hear about the most are things like SOC two or ISO twenty seven thousand one are really common. I think what you're going to see is um, identity management around the access of the data. They're going to ask for securitization of the data um, at rest, which is basically encryption. But there's another aspect of it to make sure that um, the separation of data is effective because on a lot of our platforms in a single database, we're storing multiple customers' information alongside each other. So that adds an added risk. But then the third aspect is that, and the other um, panelists have mentioned this, is that data is very fluid not even just inside a company, but between organizations. And when data gets fluid like that, a lot of it is human process. And so a fair bit of the compliance um, work around data security is going to be, you know, what type of data you have, where do you generally want it to be stored, and how are you testing to make sure it's not leaking outside of those boundaries. Um, and then you'll solve for the broader set of the requests from an auditor or someone in a certification process. Yeah, that uh, that fluidity of data, you know, I, th I think um, in kind of the, the human piece of it, I, I think that's what we've been trying to um, solve for for a long time, right? It's, um, you know, if we could just take the humans away from it. Um, but but Scott, I wanted to uh, to hear from you on uh, uh, data security, both both kind of the problem and and uh, current solution sets. Yeah, 100%. Um... So you mentioned earlier, we, we used to talk about DLP and malware and endpoint and all this stuff. And as we're like melting away the outside of our multi-layer gumball thing, whatever that is, uh, with cloud solutions and, and uh, Azure and GCP and Amazon, AWS, things like on the outside that we used to take a lot of care of are now just being handed off to SaaS providers, right? So all this like edge control and um, compute resource and like more and more deep into the multi-layer of protection. That's why you're starting to get into, oh man, you know, I really don't have any insight into how this data is being accessed, how it's being protected. When do I even know if a problem is happening with access? And because we've been stripping out, stripping away that outer layer with services, we're now getting better insight and focus and time to be able to work on that last piece, which is how do you access data, right? And um, many people in here have talked about, you know, you've got authorized access and then you've got authorized access and a little bit less authorized access. And then the next thing you know, you've got unauthorized access and it's really hard to keep your, keep your head around unless you've got good insight into what data, especially what data is important to the company and what data drives the company itself and what data could be dangerous to the company. So those, those kind of classifications of data are just as important as how do I protect this data? And I think we're doing a better job as security professionals of digging into that data classification and how important is it so we can spend the right amount of time on the right thing. Data classifications, they, uh, an interesting area, right? Um, you're really trying to take the legalese, right? We've got public, private, confidential. Um, we, we've got different layers and trying to figure out what pieces, what elements of data that we have, how do we tag them? How do we maintain them? Um, who assigns them, right? Is this an AI platform? Is this people? Is this part of a, a process? Um, is this uh, something that an owner of a document, um, you know, kind of tags and creates? 
you, you would you would mention DLP, um, and I'm going to go back to you on this, Scott. Um, most DLP, you know, when I, I talk to a lot of uh, a lot of customers, a lot of large organizations, and oh yes, we have DLP. Mm. We we have it in email. Well, what about USB drives? What about your Salesforce environment, right? What about O365? There, there's a lot of vectors, um, and, and SaaS is kind of added to that problem, right? Um, you know, what? Um, uh, where where do you? Th- see things going. I've seen a lot of kind of, you know, DLP here or, or data security, maybe, um, you know, at the network layer or at the application layer. But, you know, I, I haven't run into too many solutions that uh, have many use cases. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's funny. We I get security questionnaires all the time. How do you protect against USBs? And I, and I always go, um, the, everyone has a laptop. That's way more dangerous than a USB because there's hundreds of ways to get data off of there. So one, you got to do a good job vetting kind of employees and and kind of monitoring that information. Two, I think really paying attention to what is the most important data to protect and work on because like a CEO's schedule in a Google Doc, while it would not be good to lose that data, it's probably not very risky to the organization. Whereas all of the user database or all of the user information that's in the production database probably would have a large impact if that data got lost. So you really got to pay attention to where you're spending your time and what you're focusing on. I've seen some good solutions out there that are, that are focused on kind of that production separation to enable stuff like per customer key encryption, which is really, really hard to get right and make fast. Um, I actually got some good friends over at Cyril that have a, a really cool solution um, to do some of that information, right? To provide that data protection to say, hey, this customer should be able to get to their own data and that's it and have some external controls that are a little bit more than just logical controls and then also apply those same, same controls to internal staff at an organization as well. So there's starting to be some more products that, co- that are coming on the market to help solve this kind of, all right, we're getting to the to the real core of what we need to protect and how do we do it effectively? Good, um, Justin. Um, you know, in the in the compliance area, I think we've all seen uh, the the addition of um, uh, DLP and or insider threat to a lot of the uh, a lot of the frameworks that are out there, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I I think as we have matured um, cybersecurity programs over time. You know, we, we feel we, we're doing a, an adequate job from the outside. Um, so we, we've kind of changed that scope and perspective and now started to look internally, especially with the pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone's working from home. Visibility was probably more poor as we've lost that network layer of visibility, right? What, um, uh, how do you, do you think insider threat and DLP have, have helped kind of put the focus on uh, data security platforms? And it certainly helps because some of the major breaches are happening from work work at home. That one, you know, aspect of the network that you couldn't quite control for, especially as things have been shifting really rapidly. Um, I think the Colonial Pipeline breach was pretty epic, and that was a couple of years ago. And that had to do with them moving from out of the office into a remote working situation during COVID and having that exposure. Um, you know, there's a you, one of the ways to think about compliance is it is quality assurance, right? Of of a security posture that a company is operating, and unlike other things that we test, you're actually not looking for a strength; you're looking for the worst weakness. That that is the the it, and I'm you know one on one security a little bit here, but I'm I'm uh, growing better in in my ability to understand it. And so if you're looking for the weakest link, we're actually finding that the weakest link is in a firewall, right? Like it's, it's fairly straightforward to set up a good firewall. It's fairly straightforward to set up a good database architecture. Although when breaches happen in those spaces, they are, they are epic and there is a lot of data that can be leaked, but it's the human element that is the softest target. Uh, we learn that over and over and over again. And really the best tools that we have today, while these DLP platforms are catching up in how pervasive they get and how good they can get at recognizing where data is, is helping humans learn how to control the data that they are operating with, essentially. That, that is 
you know, until technology catches up and I have a feeling that we as workers will want more and more fluid ways to work with data as we go forward. So it's, it's almost like you're constantly trying to counterbalance more efficient ways of doing business with systems and tools that provide 100% accuracy uh, to keeping data secure. And it's going to be a little bit of an arms race. I think it always has been maybe a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that there's ever going to be an end to the, uh, to the arms race. Um, <laughs> Sam, I, I saw your uh, head nod when uh, Justin had said compliance is really kind of QA, right? And I, I've often looked at I, IT security as, um, you know, that for the rest of the, uh, the, the rest of the environment, the rest of the organization, you're, you're trying to make sure that uh, developers are, are doing the right things that they need to do to um, when, when they develop applications, uh, your end users are, are managing data um, properly from beginning until end, right? You know, we, we've got, uh, um, you know, how are we disposing of data? How are we creating data? How are we identifying it? Are we sharing it in the right manner? Um, identity, I think, plays such an important role. And, and a, a lot of data security, it seems, comes down to access, right? Access controls. Um, you know, identity has been under attack for a number of years. Can you talk about identity's impact in, in kind of the whole data security uh, area? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I could take it even a little higher level. Really, any kind of tool that you implement, um, you know, typically you want IT uh, or, or IT or even department implement the tool, they want people to use it, right? They want people to use it properly. Um, and so when we talk about sharing data um, and wanting to secure that data, you don't want it to be a burden, right? So you do need to hit certain compliance things like you were talking about. But for example, um, you know, we've created these workflows. So for example, when say somebody in finance um, who should be allowed to say, share a document with one of their consulting organizations, right? That's outside. Um, they might just have uh, a workflow that says, you know, after a week, do you still want this document shared, right? So it, it's, it's allowing the business to do what they need. It's allowing them to stay in compliance. It's, it's a little more, let's call it customer centric or in, in user centric. So it's basically keeping compliance, right? Um, obviously there's all sorts of different layers of compliance. But to be able to do things like that, where you know you you want to enable the business, you don't want to stop them from doing things, um, but just either to give them the reminders. Of course, you know the platform can also just automatically stop it if they're not allowed to do it, if they're say on a on a risk level, or um, you know if let's say even that third party, that consulting firm that they're working with, let's say they share the document with somebody else, like say they're using a contract now, you've got fourth party people using it. So that could be compliance, right? Like, is that consulting firm allowed to share your company data with their contractors, right? We all know stories. I mean, that's, this is where, you know, years ago, the Snowden and all that kind of stuff, right? Where contractors allowed to, to see stuff. So, so there's that. Um, I, I did also just want to touch on DLP since you brought that up. Um, you know, DLP has been around a long, long time. And a lot of people do have DLP. But but I think, uh, and I want to mention because it it's it's a hot topic. We we it's probably one of the biggest um, kind of inbound requests and questions we get is around DLP. Um, you know, because DLP wasn't necessarily built for kind of SaaS and, and kind of this modern world we're now in. So um, you know, making sure that when you are you know putting in a DLP solution in place, making sure that it can um, you know handle kind of SaaS environments. We, we hear a lot of. Um, what they call like false positives and alerts, right? Because what DLP solutions do is they'll alert you when stuff is going on. But you, you want to make sure that they have the context, right? When they're, when an alert is happening. So, um, you know, unstructured data is often where the issues are, right? Because DLP solutions, a lot of the older ones, that they can't handle that um, unstructured data piece and, and putting it into context and saying, yeah, you've got an issue here. So um, the platform thing, just to kind of take it back full circle, which is what we were talking about at the beginning, making sure you have a platform that can see across all of the different SaaS platforms you're working on, right? You want your HR connected because you might have these at-risk employees. You know, you might want your finance, you know, 
uh, apps connected as well. And all that context can give you the right alerts um, to hit your compliance to bring it back to that. So, yeah, I think context can, is. Can, um, can I add to that go, conversation? Go ahead, Nico. Add, right. So, so what, what I'm hearing my customers tell me is that on premise, you know, there's a lot of data that can be protected. You can protect the data because you can identify who's accessing the data, or you can prevent people from accessing the data. And if they do, you can block them, right? You can, you can apply a bunch of policies to a variety of and a variety of network elements to do so. The challenge is when you go to the cloud, an S3 bucket you can access through a URL, right? So, so how do you prevent uh, use cases, uh, unwanted use cases in the cloud? So those are the things I hear my customers tell me. So how, how can we do that, right? So there's a variety of technologies that are being built, solutions being built right now that can address those issues. I think I'm going to go back as well to the premise of this uh, present of this um, session, really is, is there a single data security solution? My take is there's none, right? It's, it's, it's an evolving space, but there are a series of solutions that sit in front of databases. It, it encrypts data that can be, so it, so it can be prevent, so it can be prevented from access or from, mal, from, from ransomware. Um, we talked about DLP. I've seen uh, solutions to isolate malware designed to exfiltrate data or track access to certain data and so on, right? So I think it's an evolving space and there's really is no one data security platform, so to speak. Yeah, Miko, great, uh, great point. You know, one, one of the things that I would say, you know, kind of predates this data security, data security platform um, is information rights management, right? You know, that, that was something that uh, was a, um, had a lot of promise, I think a flash in a pan, hey, we're, we're gonna put, all of the focus on the data, we're going to encrypt them, you know, essentially kind of have them in a safe, we'll know who they're going to, people will have to go to kind of a, a central point to unlock. Um, you know, the it, it never really took off, right? There were, there were a couple of vendors, Microsoft has something there, I think that they've kind of redeveloped and uh, put in their um, uh, 0365 environment. Um, you know, I, I, th I think more of a, of, um, uh, it, it, it's still something that I think is incomplete. Um, you know, is, is, is what you're seeing on the data security side from a, from a plat platform or solution perspective, do you expect this to, to actually get some legs or is this going to be another flash in the pan because it's incomplete? I, I can't speak much to that piece because I'm not familiar with that or an expert at it, but I can tell you that data placement is across multiple places now, right? On-prem, Cloud, different different places. I, I look I look at placement. I have data in SharePoint, for example, or in Office, uh, and apps accessing this data. So I think what will happen now is that uh, technologies we use like identity, contacts, uh, and so on uh, will be enhanced so that specific clients will be will essentially it comes down to zero trust technologies or or concepts. I think will be will be not necessarily replaced but augment or improve or evolve. Uh, uh, what I'm seeing in the what I'm seeing in front of my customers. All right, Gil. Um, so Miko mentioned zero trust, um, and uh, what, while NIST has a kind of a gray definition of what it is, um, you know, I, I think I, I put data security platforms or data security solutions in the same bucket where every vendor that's out there is going to have their own take on it, right? Whether it's well. We're a data security platform, we encrypt data. We're a data security platform, we identify data loss. Um, is, is this something that we, we can firm up a definition on or is it really going to be up to every solution provider that's in the market to have kind of their own take on what data security is? Well, it depends on the angle that you're looking at it from, right? I mean, if you're a cloud provider and you're providing API interfaces to other vendors, then when you say zero trust, you're going to be looking at you know, your attack surface. And that may include the vendors using your API. It may be including your internal employees. Um, you know, if you're a provider down the stack, you may be looking at zero trust in a little bit of different way because maybe you're not exposing um, anything programmatic. So I think the definition at a high level is exactly the same. It's where you're assuming that there's an attacker out there um, and they're going to get in. And so your premises don't trust anyone um, or anything and, and make sure 
every single connection is authenticated and authorized. Um, and, and I think that will continue, right? You'll just get more and more granularity as the solution space kind of expands. Um, one thing I do want to uh, kind of point out and just reflect on what Mika was saying, um, you know, and, and about what you were saying, Chris, about some of the solutions, right? Because, you know, the reasons why those solutions didn't take off was because it really comes against the openness of the web, right? If you think about the web, it's all about, hey, let's create a standard, you know, let's create a document format that anybody can open and any client, it's open source, you know, that's the mentality. Uh, moving from that to, hey, you, you need to go through this proxy to approve it, or you need to download this software package to unlock it. It's just not the same. Um, but I do think, you know, actually, I look at databases as an area where they've managed to start cracking that model, you know, and if you look at, you know, in the in the past, databases were like, oh, what's your login? You kind of come in, it's at the database level. Then they went to the table level. I mean, now it's at the literally at the cell level. You know, it's it's data within columns and rows that could be segmented pretty pretty easily. So I think they've cracked that. Um, I think we need to do the same thing on the unstructured side um, and almost create like an like a platform that we have now for SSO. You know, that's been a, a challenge, and I think the industry managed to solve it pretty well. We just need an SSO to be able to provide visibility at the content level, you know, within a document, what is your permission? Right. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I like that. The, um, you know, I, I think the, the end goal of security, it, it's like rails on a road. You know, it, it, it's there. We know they're there. Hopefully we don't bump into them. So it, the, the security that, uh, that we have should feel transparent. Um, but in, in this area of kind of unstructured data, when we're talking about sharing documents and all of that, the, the only thing that, um, that we've been able to create is uh, a good bit of friction. And, and I think it's that friction that drives the, the lack of use. Um, you know, I, I, uh, one of you had mentioned, you know, sharing a document, Sam, I think it was you, where you can put like a, uh, a, a life thing on it, right? We, I want to share this document, but maybe for a week, um, you know, how, how to, you know, captivate, contain that data, um, you know, Scott, have you have you seen anything in the marketplace that um, is really trying to do that? Um, you know, protect the data wherever it may be. Um, something that is, you know, I could share to you and Sam. Uh, maybe one of you has uh, read access, the other one has read write copy or or what have you. Um, have you seen anything down to the data level for unstructured data? I mean. I think the cloud providers are getting better at providing this because that's really what everything we talk about here is just a bolt on to something that's not built the right way. And so as consumers uh, getting that feedback and pushing products to be able to do that, like what you just described there, you can do in G Suite today, right? You can do that in G Suite. G Suite actually made a bunch of improvements on share the link. And now it's like anyone who has the link inside the organization is the can be a default as opposed to anyone that has the link, right? So it's getting better and more and more feedback. Unfortunately, there's not a single solution to all of this stuff, right? Because of this unstructured or structured or many different places that data can reside. I think, I think our job as security professionals is really think about what to prioritize to manage risk, right? Our job is not to make risk zero. Our job is to help the organization manage risk. Um, and if that risk is all the things have to be zero risk, then you, you might just maybe turn the company off because that's really the only way to zero out risk is to just shut down the business. Um, so when I'm talking about this, I'm saying, what is important to your business to start focus on, right? You can only spend so much time in so many areas, really start on what's really important. If your unstructured data in, SharePoint or Google Drive or whatever, Dropbox or whatever other solution you're using is the most important thing. There's lots of solutions out there to, to, to go look into. The other thing you got to remember as a security pro is think about it from the end user side. It's not important to alert yourself to problems. It's important to enable the users to use the thing that you're looking at getting so that they will use it. 
So that I th we we tend to we when we go buy security tools, we tend to think about it as like, ooh, where will this send me alerts, and how will it alert me, and how will it enrich this data so that I know what's going on, and we totally ignore how will my end users use it, because if they don't use it, it doesn't do any good. Yeah, the uh, uh, department of no, right? You know, just mm. shut the business off. It's I, I think a lot of IT security professionals out there. Um, you know, think that uh, we live in a world of black and white where in, in reality, it's all gray. Um, there's business risk, business people accept risk every day. Um, you know, we're, we're here to support them building a widget, whatever kind of widget that is. Um, you know, what, one of the things that you said uh, I, I thought was interesting, where, where it can reside, right? And, um, you know, it could be structured, it could be unstructured, you know, it could live uh, in the cloud, on-prem, on an endpoint, can be anywhere. The one commonality is network, right? All of them cross networks, but I, I think over time we've seen uh, kind of the network perimeter disappear, mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's also been an increase in, in power and CPU and everything else. Um, you know, Miko, are we are we losing anything? You know, I, I think kind of that in the network space, there's been this, um, you know, less focus on network as a solution from a security perspective. We're focused on endpoint, we're focused on SaaS or cloud. Um, you know, are, are there new things in the network space that can help identify this? Everything's crossing a network boundary. So that's very true, right? Um, everything does cross the network boundary. So the boundary itself is, let's say, changing. It's extending beyond uh, what you normally call a boundary. Um, so the way we are looking at this is that we expect your threats inside the network, um, so, which means threats inside the data center, or in our case, we work with service providers inside their networks into their, enter, into their subscribers as well. So where you would, what, what I'm, expecting is that where you would have, let's say, concentrated solutions, consolidated solutions, um, you will have a set of designs where it's going to be distributed and consolidated. You're going to have uh, network pushes to the edge. If it's in a data center, instead of having, let's say, um, um, concentrated firewalls, you may have distributed solutions with concentration so that you can capture traffic uh, that's going through from compute to get to, to, to other, uh, whether it's computing, compute inside the network. So you can, so I think you're, what I'm saying is that what you think of a network solution, which is a piece of hardware or software that is, that's, that, that's, you know, is where traffic goes through will extend all the way to the compute, right? Um, so you're gonna have, and that piece of software will be both mitigation and detection as well. And then, so this will also feed into send signals back to a central system or uh, a, a, maybe it's a data platform additional additional um, new tools where or existing tools which can take the signals and then crunch them and provide better you know better uh, threat scoring or or um, uh, an indication of your of your security posture that's what I'm saying good um, I, don't, I don't know if uh, any of you had uh, um, had a chance to see this so um, Mudge who uh, used to be the security officer at Twitter, um, th there was some information that got released over the last couple of days um, that uh, it, it appears that there was a lot of development in production directly, um, that, uh, that their test QA dev systems weren't necessarily used, and that um, over 5,000 of the 11,000 employees had access to uh, production environments, including production data, including um, uh, direct messages and, and the like. Sam, um, you know, large companies that have quote unquote developed a product, right? And this can be Okta. We've seen issues with Okta, Uber, Twitter, others that, you know, from the outside looking in, right? We, we see, wow, this is a very capable uh, IT company. Um, you know, brilliant people, brilliant data scientists, brilliant engineers, site reliability engineers, developers, um, thousands and thousands of, of, you know, probably PhDs that work there. Um, but seemingly they have the same issue that a small company would with, you know, people accessing records that maybe they shouldn't. Um, I, outside of, you know, kind of leaking data, you know, internal access, I, th I think is, um, you know, an issue everywhere. Um, you know, are, are data security platforms and solutions able to, um, 
uh, identify this kind of behavior, maybe sans friction, you know, provide this type of visibility and uh, kind of control inside? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I'll even take it one step further. Um, you know, we've been talking about data, but um, there's something called shadow applications, shadow IT, right, which is a very hot growing subject topic that we're seeing. So, you know, somebody's sharing this and that, what about using their Gmail account or their corporate account or Slack account to log into something else? What about a third party using shadow apps, right? So um, that's a whole different discussion, but I just wanted to bring it up because we're talking about networks. I mean, it's really um, that, that piece of sharing and data and SaaS, um, there's a lot of different elements at play uh, that can make, um, that, that can open it up to vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, we talked about identity um, as well, you know, making, and, and also we, I, I think Scott had mentioned that, you know, Google does have some stuff in the admin layer. Um, you know, there, there's a number of different apps that do have some native, let's just call them native protections. Um, but, you know, most of them want to enable you to, um, you know, be as efficient as possible. They don't necessarily want to create too many restrictions. So that's not really their MO, so to speak. So, you know, I don't necessarily, actually our CEO used to work at Google. Um, you know, we created this because he saw this big gap and it didn't really look like Google was moving towards um you know doing do what we're what we're filling in so and i think you probably see the same thing because you know you share on salesforce.com you share on you know github slack you share on all these they want you to share right it, it allows the platform to grow um exponentially so it's really up to each company to to protect their employees to protect their data um, and so, you know, you do need just to come full circle on your question. I think you do need a platform that can help bridge all of these together um, so that you can, you know, be protected, but you can still use all of these different apps that make you efficient. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, Gil, um, we, we've seen um, cloud is empowered a lot of things, right? Um, you know, I, I think it's a very powerful. I think it's. Um, you know, been a critical building block for a lot of startups, a lot of companies, um, you, you know, a, a lot of great things I think have been uh, developed as a result of cloud. But I, I would also say it's complicated things. You know, we for a long time, right, it, it, most of our data was internal. We, we had built that castle wall and that moat around it. Um, everything now is interconnected. And it's not just our data that's gone to the cloud. Um, can, can you talk about kind of supply chain, um, you know, the, those threats, kind of that adding, right? You know, maybe I'm a large company and I've decided to outsource my accounts payable and accounts receivable. That means I have people at another organization that are accessing my ERP system um, in, in transactions within that system. Somehow my security team still needs to handle ads, move changes, right? Terminations, onboarding. Uh, changes of security levels for, for those employees, um, you know, is, is all of this, um, you know, from, from a security solutions perspective, are we moving in the right direction? You know, it, it does feel like that we are losing a lot of ground. Yeah, it's a great question. And let me even take it a step back, right? You're assuming that you have a security team, uh, but most companies, they have, you know, a few, a few guys or gals at IT and, you know, one day they're also the security team and they have to install all these, you know, new software and understand them and understand the vulnerabilities around them and try to protect them. Um, and, and that's a huge challenge in my mind. And, you know, going back to this Twitter um, incident, right? It's, you know, think about it. If you're a company that's, that's in healthcare, um, then you need to, you know, probably do HIPAA and you need to do SOC 2. Why? Because, you know, the vendors you're going to sell to and work with, um, including the government, they're going to expect that from you and they're not going to do business with you without it. Um, I think in the consumer space, it's a little bit open-ended. Um, you know, some good companies take it upon themselves to protect the data and 
and, and kind of take the trust that the customer's given them seriously and they invest in it. But a lot of companies, you know, they don't do that because sometimes it even conflicts with the business. You know, a business like Twitter, I can understand why the business would want to be, you know, fast and agile and, oh, just get it onto production. Hey, it's just tweets. Um, and they're really not not really understanding the, the power and the danger, you know, within their platform. Um, and therefore, they're not giving it the right attention. So, you know, I think with the cloud, with moving everything to these, you know, shadow IT, as Sam mentioned, you know, we're just putting a lot more strain on IT organizations to try to make sense out of it. On one hand, they want to serve the business, right? Because the business, you know, you have a CEO, they go and meet another CEO and they say, oh, yeah, I just signed up for this cloud thing. It took me five minutes, right? They go back without expectation to IT and they say, hey, I want the same thing. Right, so IT is, has changed dramatically, and the expectations have changed. Um, and and I think the business needs to understand that, you know, it'll take a little bit of time to, to for security to catch up. Um, and I think some of the new tools that are coming up, they're taking that into consideration. Right, they have the plugins already pre built in with a lot of the tools. They're trying to streamline the communication between the different platforms. You know, so they're getting there, but. Like you said, it's it's a huge challenge in my mind. It it is a uh, a big challenge, and and with that, you know, I I think the evolving marketplace, um, you know, has, has made things even more difficult from a buyer's perspective. Um, Scott and uh, Justin, I'd, I'd like you guys to to feel this one. Um, so in 2010, uh, there were roughly a hundred cybersecurity companies that you would buy products from. A couple, a couple of years later, 2013, it's, it's alleged that there were uh, a, around 1,000. 2017, 3,000. I, I was told the global number this year, there are 23,000 IT security, cybersecurity companies that have product solutions in the marketplace. Um, you know, how, how do we make sense of this? Are we moving in the right direction? You know, it, it, you know I, I think it's... Uh, the difference, you, you go to a cheesecake factory where they have an 85 page menu of options versus somewhere where, you know, here's 10 things that you can you can choose from. Um, you know, what the, the question to you guys, one, why are there 23,000 solutions in the marketplace? And and two, is, is that does this point to our lack of success as an industry? Scott, you want to go first, or I can... no, Justin, do you go first? Okay, um, I just uh, I, I'm not a 20 year vet on penetration testing and cybersecurity as an architecture, but as a CTO and now a CEO, I, I think that um, part of the reason there are so many companies that's been such a rapid growth is there are so many problems, and we're constantly inventing new ones as we have seen a dramatic shift into cloud providers like AWS for where we, you know, I don't rack hardware anymore. Um, we provision an EC2 uh, in the cloud via code, you know, via Terraform. And so it, it, it's just that the space has gotten so porous and where there's a lot of problems and people are willing to spend money, you'll find investors willing to fund companies to go and try and solve those problems. And, and part of our attempt I think was to fill in all the gaps. You know, you mentioned one common thing between all these aspects is the network. I, I'd push one other aspect that's more common to all of these challenges for data protection, and that is the human beings involved in the organizations mm -hmm. and their behavior, whether it is picking the security tools that they buy, which is now very hard, as you mentioned, because you're weeding through thousands and thousands of potential tools uh, and it's just hard to understand the value and how they all fit together, let alone to the person selling the Google Doc, right? And, and so as I, I think that um, we won't find one ring to rule them all. And we see this on the compliance side, right? Like the standards define an expectation to meet certain security practices, but they don't tell you what to implement. They're a measurement tool, right? They're like, we would like to see you protect data at rest, but they don't tell you the encryption level that you have to have on the database. And so it's going to come, and um, what we believe is that organizations are unique. They're going to do this risk analysis that Scott talked about, 
They're going to identify those areas that they want to implement a good security posture. And some of those are going to come as technology tools, but at least they get the scope right. Like they're like, hey, we need to solve for firewall and therefore we're going to look for a good firewall product. Um, but I just think you're going to split the categorizations out a ton. Scott. Yeah, I think you got it dead right. Like the, the inherent challenge here is people. And if you talk to, so in, we do application security, right? So we talk to 10 different companies and we're talking about how their applications do authentication. We talk to 10 companies, we get 25 different iterations of authentication because of the people that are developing the code. So every single business is unique and different and has its specific challenge because not every business is doing the same thing, right? If there was 1400 Twitters that all did the exact same thing, made their money with ad revenue, they'd probably all be testing in prod so they can deliver the most uh, value fastest to their customers and to the people that are paying them. But everybody's doing something different. And that is why you, you kind of see this divergence from platform plays where you're like, I want to buy one platform that has little squares that solve all of my problems. That used to be the way that we bought, bought security software and bought solutions, but it turned out they weren't quite right for anything at that point. So that's where you start getting into point solutions where people are, whether they're founders or investors or consumers looking for a very specific thing that they can either plug in and works the way that they want it to for their problem, or they can customize to their problem very few people go, you know what, I'm going to change my process and, and flow to meet the solution. We've we tried that too. That's not very effective because uh, that usually means bad experience for end users. But that is absolutely what's happening and why the explosion in the space is happening is because everyone has a different problem and those different problems need different solutions. Great. I've got uh, one last question and we'll have to uh, keep, keep it short. I'm going to ask Miko and Sam um, to touch on this. So Scott had mentioned authentication being different in a lot of places. You know, if uh, we, we, we're all, we're all uh, gray beards, even though uh, Miko and Gil and Justin uh, don't, don't have uh, much facial hair. Um, uh, AAA back in the day, authentication, authorization, and accounting, right? Um, so to, to you two, is the problem in this space really authentication or are we talking authorization um, is kind of the root from, you know, one thing that I've kind of identified over time, those two are, are very different things. You can have an authentication store and there is no authorization inside of it, right? That, that's kind of within the application itself. Um, can, you, can you two talk about the, um, you, you know, uh, maybe the failings of both of those or, or, you know, is that an area that we need to, um, you know, ha have improved uh, focus and solutions around? Sam, you, you go ahead. Um, yeah, sure. I guess I'll start. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I used to work at a company called Savient, and I worked at Plain ID. You know, so I, I, I've seen it from the authorization side and from identity management side and everything. Um, yeah, you know, there it, it's like a stereo system, right? Like you have, if you have great speakers, but the cable wire is okay your stereo is not going to sound that great, even though you spent, you know, $800,000 on some great system, but that cable didn't work. So all those components that you're talking about, the authentication, authorization, right? They're, they're all important. Um, you know, what, what do control has been focusing on is again, providing that context on the data side. Um, you know, we're not really, dealing with the authentication authorization side, but it, but it is more around author, authorization because once you're in, what do you have access to, right? That's a big question that a lot of companies are dealing with. Um, big rabbit hole, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I won't go down that, but just to give you a taste, yeah. Thanks, Miko. Yeah, just to add just to add to that, I think the olden days, what we were looking at is, you know, I have a gatekeeper in front of a network or in front of a, it's generally in front of a network, right? Once you're in, you're, you're authenticated, what access can you do? What can you do inside? What were your rights uh, or entitlements once you go through? I think now the problem is even bigger, right? Because it's not just inside, outside, but it's inside. Once you're inside, uh, like, uh, you know, 
it's not just the network, it's the devices, or it's, or it's the applications you can get to, it's the data you can get to. And so think of, think of authentication authorization. Now you need to use it across inside your environment. And, um, and then so and not only do you have to authenticate, let's say, the user, now it's also clients. And on the clients, where are they coming from? Is it internal client, external clients? Uh, so location, contacts, contacts as well, right? So I think the the this the spaces has evolved quite dramatically than than what started as 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 a, what I used to know as AAA, you know, with radius and so on. Um, and then it's also between networks and between between applications crossing bounds. We, we talked about SSO, and then we talk about API to API communication. So I think the space is just rich now. It's very rich. It's a whole industry. Yes. Uh, thank you all. Great discussion so far. Really appreciate your time. Uh, in the few minutes we have left remaining, I'd love to prompt each of you uh, for some self-promotion, whether that's your company website, your own personal social media. The floor is yours. Chris, as you moderate, we'll let you go last. So Sam, we'll start with you. And do please keep these short. We are running out of time here. <laughs> thank you. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. This has been great. I really like this platform as well. Um, yeah, so Do Control, we are the SaaS security platform company. You know, we help you with automated self-service tools um, that companies need for SaaS application data access, monitoring, orchestration, remediation. Um, we basically take a really unique customer-focused approach to the challenge of labor-intensive risk management security and you know, health and DLP type stuff, CASB stuff. Uh, soon, uh, shadow apps. Um, so if you're using SaaS applications and your company is sharing uh, data or anything across SaaS apps, um, check out Do Control. Uh, we can help make sure that all of your uh, SaaS landscape is secure. Thank you. Gil, 30 seconds or less, please. Sure, thanks. Well, first of all, thanks, everyone. This was great. Um, so if you, you know, if you have... Um, uh, assets that uh, that you're looking to protect, um, you really uh, should check us out. You know, we're trying to change the game with uh, with the IoT space and bring a lot of intelligence to monitoring the things that you care about. We're talking about security here, um, but in our industry, we're looking at um, protecting uh, drugs, uh, food services, uh, food items, and uh, different medications. So. Um, Check us out, smartsense.co. Thank you. Miko. Hi, I'm Miko Desini. Um, yeah, ADA Networks really is in the intersection between networking and security. So if you're thinking of, let's say, and we work with very large enterprises and service providers. So we focus mostly on things like DDoS, uh, protecting large uh, networks, um, services inside the networks. Uh, that's one. The other area we focus on is application security. That would mean like uh, um, delivering the applications and securing them using uh, next generation WAF solutions. Uh, if you have, uh, and, and then we also decrypt encrypt traffic to send to um, DLP platforms. Um, and we're at ethanetworks.com. Thank you very much. Uh, Scott, you're next. Yeah, we've been talking about data security here. Uh, applications that you're developing internally naturally have access to all that data because they're supposed to. Stackhawk is all about testing those applications that you're building for security vul vulnerabilities so you can fix them before you push them into production. Check us out at stackhawk.com. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, actually, no, we have two left. I'm sorry. Justin. Yeah, briefly, um, pleasure to be here. Uh, Strikegraph.com is a compliance orchestration and assurance platform. Uh, so we help our customers design a security posture um, distribute responsibility through that for that security posture throughout their organization and automate the collection of evidence from a variety of cloud providers. So you're prepared to go into audit, penetration test, certification, which is another part of the StrikeGraph solution. We deliver SOC 2, ISO 27001, PCI DSS, HIPAA, GDPR, CMMC, uh, and the um, NIST 800-171 standard certifications as well. Okay, thank you. And Chris, uh, very briefly. Yes, uh, Christopher Pruitt with Inversion 6, uh, inversion6.com. You can find more out about us there. Thanks. 
There we go. Short and sweet. Love it. Sorry to rush you guys at the end here, but uh, that will do it for this panel. Uh, if you're watching live, I encourage you to stick around for our next panel, last of the day for InfoSec, Encryption in the Cloud, Now and the Future. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paul. Thank you for watching. Thank you guys for your attention and expertise today. Really appreciate it. Hope you have a great afternoon, and we will see you next time.